Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Philip Martin, and I'm very happy and honored to be joined today by world-renowned swordsmith Peter Lyon, who has created some of the most iconic hero swords uh, from movies like Lord of the Rings, uh, The Hobbit, um, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and other Chronicles of Narnia movies, uh, just to name a few. Uh, hi, Peter. Thank you very much Hello. for joining me here. Yep. yep. Thanks for the invite. Yeah. I guess it was um, a little over four years ago that we, we first started chatting on Facebook about uh, a new sword that you're adding to the Master Swordsmith line, the uh, Sword of Boar Beer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what are, your, what are your feelings? What are your thoughts and emotions when, you, when returning to, to making these swords um, so many years after making them originally for the, for the Lord of the Rings? I guess it's been more than 20 years now. Yeah, it has. Well, for me, it even started earlier than that because you saw the first first part of the trilogy in 2001, December, but I'd mm -hmm. already been working on it for two years before that. So by the time it got to screen, it was already uh, sort of history for me and we'd moved on to other things. But yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's really interesting going back at, because I'm also looking at younger me. So yeah. making a sword today I've got another 20 years of experience. And uh, so I look back at the swords that I was making on Lord of the Rings. And fortunately, we've got most of the original Steel Hero swords available. Mm -hmm. And uh, think about, um, yeah, how differently I might do it these days. Right. So it does create an interesting issue because if I tried to make a sword just like the original, um, it'll have a lot of flaws or things mm -hmm. that I perceive as flaws now. Right. And uh, yeah, sorry about the beep. Um, yeah, so I'd have a lot of things that I perceive as flaws now. And so sometimes the question is, with the original swords being entirely handmade, with things like uh, hand, uh, hand sculpted masters for bronze castings and things like that, mm -hmm. if we were to just copy that today, we have fidelity to the film sword, but from a collector's viewpoint, the sword has a lot of flaws that it doesn't need to have. So... So we're always left with this issue of, okay, what do we what do we make now? Do we make the sword as it was, or do we make the sword as we wanted to make it? Right. And Sting is a good example of that because we offered that in two different forms. One was as used on screen with transfers sealed under epoxy, which uh, was rather a flat look, or the way we would have liked to have done it with the actual silver inlay running up the grip and right. interestingly the collectors all forked out a lot of extra money to get the silver inlay so it was sort of like sting as we wanted to make it not as we had to make it at the time and so right. yeah there's always these issues to face with a a remaking of a sword from over 20 years ago yeah yeah well speaking of uh younger you uh, if you don't mind and and, and let me know if you do I like to share some pictures oh, no. that I've found. Have I, have I got a mullet? Well, from this angle, I can't quite tell. Oh, um, yeah. That was the <laughs> mullet period. Okay. But when I saw this uh, image, I knew that I wanted to, to speak with you about it because there's some really interesting swords in yep. this. In this and, yeah, uh, there's a lot there. Yeah. So do you remember when this was taken and where? Is it Weta? Uh, Yes, that would have been, oh, that was definitely Weta, yes. Um, I'm trying to think. That's probably in the workspace I'm still in, except now that there are shelves where, where I'm standing. That would have been 2001, probably. Okay. Uh, yep. And the reason being that that big sword on the left was made for a, a scene that had been written for a fight between Aragorn and uh, Sauron. Right. And then in the end, they decided that it was just too much for change from the book and that it simply wouldn't work because really Sauron face to face with Aragorn is no contest. Like right. Ar Aragorn would have been stomped. <laughs> so that, that scene was cut, but the sword was made. And mm -hmm. that sword was interesting in particular because it was made in only a few days. Have a picture here, oh, yep. <laughs> yes, and I think that sword gets reused somewhere else, but 
yes, the the scene was cut, though the prop was made. So I think that does date it to about 2001. So did you make then that got, sword or what was it made of? Uh, I made the blade for that sword. The hilt of that's entirely model made and then cast in urethane. And the paint job on that is to make it look like the whole hilt is metal, but the, the heat from Sauron has uh, basically blued it mm. from, from all the heating. Yeah. So how heavy was that? Not very heavy because it's aluminium and plastic. Ah, okay. So it, it's probably only about a bit over a kilogram. Okay. Okay. And yes, uh, I will. I will insist mm. on using metric. Yes. <laughs> well, so um, another sword in there that I didn't it took me a little while to figure out whose sword it was. The mm -hmm. the gold. Um, yes. Sword just to your right in that in that photo. Yes. Uh, that's Denethor's sword, right? That's that's right, yes. And uh, you never see it on screen, but that sword does have a blade. Ah, okay. okay. Yep. On screen, on screen, he only ever carries the sword in the scabbard. But because we didn't know how things would be shot on the day, and Peter Jackson's famous for wanting to switch things on the day when he's filming, we just made sure it had a blade and it could be drawn. Otherwise, it would have just been a, a short stub to plug into a scabbard, and right. uh, that would have been enough. But yes, yeah, so it's a fully formed sword, and yeah, it will still be somewhere. And all the pieces on the scabbard are made of brass sheet that have been etched and then soldered together and then attached to the scabbard. So that was quite right. challenging. Yeah, it's an interesting sword. Um, I see a couple of, I think in other interviews, you've uh, mentioned the two swords right in front of your right hand are a couple of your favorites, the uh, yep. sword of uh, Arwen and uh, Amir's yes. sword. Yes. Yep. Now, Arwen's sword is just nice because it's it's like a big yet again, mm -hmm. and uh, it's, it's just got lots of nice details in the design. And of course, and Amir's sword, it's those horse's heads, the, right. the way that they wrap around opposing sides of the blade. Yeah, asymmetrical guard. Yeah, it's an attractive sword. Uh, and then I guess uh, of these swords, you've made three of them so far in your Master Swordsmith's collection. The um, we've got Witch King. We're working on yep. Aowen now. Interestingly, the Aowen sword that we've got sitting on the bench for reference is, of course, twenty years of aging, mm -hmm. and that Aowen sword is a lot shinier. Mm. Uh, it's interesting. Twenty years of natural aging makes a hell of a difference. So yeah, working on Aowen, done the Witch King, did Anduril long ago. Right. And yes, none of the others have been done yet. And of course, sooner or later, I expect we'll make Theoden's sword as well, simply because uh, you know, iconic character, lots of screen time. Right. But, yeah. but sometime in the future. Sounds good. Uh, I have a, let's see, let me get this to work. Yeah, here's a more recent picture of you with uh, with yep. the Master Swordsmith Collection uh, Witch King sword. Yes, a shiny it one. Looks entirely too clean. Yes, that, yep. that shiny pommel. So mm -hmm. when people order these Master Swordsmith swords, they can choose the finish, right? Yes. Yep. Anywhere from aged through through a satin finish through to a mirror polish. So yeah. So. Pretty much the range. And on something like the Witch King sword, when we do aging, it's a it's a heavier aging than I'd do on other swords that aren't meant to look that old. Right. And aging is always a fine balance too between um, getting it to look old without getting it to look totally buggered. And right. you know, when somebody's spending that much money on a sword, it's a delicate balancing act to try and figure out what they might actually be looking for in an aged finish. Now, do you go to a lot of trouble to to get that aged finish to look just as it did on the on the screen in the movies sometimes sometimes it's um sometimes it's about getting it to look right for what the buyer might want mm, right uh the age the original swords they've got quite a lot of pitting on some of them like the witch king sword in particular has a an overall pitted finish then the age rusting so it, it was pretty pretty knocked around Right, but at the same time, if you put if you do that, it may be it's the it's that old 
tension between screen fidelity and uh, getting a sword that um, looks like it's cost as much as it cost. So okay. overdo the aging a bit and uh, it, it's like, okay, well, it doesn't look like a $10,000 sword anymore. Right, right. Uh, so I think, was this the first sword in the line? I think, uh, no, Anduril, no. I, th well, I think, was the first, then okay. Strider's sword, then I think it was Glamdring. Okay. Very nice. And is that is that a, a real stone in the it is in the guard? Again, this is one of those interesting changes that we we had to make because originally the film swords were meant to have a stone set into the the hilt, but we just couldn't get the stones. Again, remember this is twenty years ago, basically no internet, so actually finding any specialist stuff was really awkward. So we cheated it with a drop of resin set into the, the recess. But again, can't do a drop of resin on a sword at that price point. So these have right. stones set in them now. Again, it's what we would have done at the time if we'd, we'd been able to, but um, yeah, we got away with it. And uh, it's, I'm not aware of anyone ever actually pointing out that the stone isn't a stone. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's a different story when you've got a sword that somebody can look at in extreme detail these days right yes i believe the um currently the only master swordsmith line sword for sale uh right now is, is uh from the hobbit movie the yes Orcus, Thor yeah that's right Orcus. yep yep we've sold out the witch king edition and we've sold out the eowyn edition so orcrist is the only one currently still on sale so yep so uh, there's a few of those left, but then that, soon, sooner or later we'll have another sword available. And that is the uh, the dwarf scale, correct? That's yes, that's large. Right. So, yeah, so it's a big sword. So if you or I were holding this, it would be a, a nice one-handed falchion. Right. But to uh, Richard Armitage, holding this as a dwarf character, we have to scale it up. So it's about a third bigger, 38%, something like that. And so it's a very big, very heavy sword. It's, uh, I think it ends up about four kilograms. Yeah, right, about six, six and a half pounds. And, yeah. and that's e yeah. even with me doing all my tricks to lighten the blade a bit. Right, right. And the hilt, uh, the dragon's tooth is some sort of resin or? Yes, that's right. Um, it's a, it's a, um, it's a two-part urethane called CC60. I did look at trying to make it out of something a, a bit harder that's got the, the hard cold feel that uh, enamel would have. Mm -hmm. The problem is that the resins are too brittle when they're like that. So CC60, even though it, it feels different, um, was the, it's true to the original film prop and it's also the only real alternative we had for something that if you were say to drop that drop that sword on the, the end of the of the grip, uh, you don't want that just snapping off. Right. Right. Yeah. So and yes, uh, I did even look at seeing if there were any natural teeth that would fit the bill, but it's such a specific design element that there's nothing that comes even close. Right. And, yeah. and whatever I could find probably would have also had issues with the CITES. Uh, legislation mm. so yeah one of those one of those times when the original film prop material is the only way to go but it still i would have liked to have well found a real dragon tooth sure <laughs> Time, times 15 yes and yeah, so uh, here is boromir yes mm. um so in, in the past you described that you've had um some influence on making uh, fantasy swords more like real swords. Um, can you can you describe the design process for for Bormir's sword and yeah, how sure. that works with this sword? Yep, it, it was pretty similar for for all of the swords during Lord of the Rings. Uh, there's a design team. Uh, they were led by John Howe in particular. Now John Howe came with a, a reenactment background from Switzerland. So as well as being an illustrator, he was also aware of what real weapons and armor do. 
So for example, swords, they're not crowbars. Armor, if you can't move in it, it's not much use. You know, if you can't move, you're protected, but then you're not going to be doing anything offensively. So he understood how things work as well as how we wanted them to look for a film prop. So he, he led a lot of the design work, though other designers did a lot of the, the sword designs, he would, uh, he would be assisting with ideas about uh, practicality. Something worth understanding is that the, the overall design ethos for Lord of the Rings was that this had to feel like a real world, but not our world. So whenever people look at these weapons and armor and, and reference them to particular things, so for example, Rohirrim, people get a, a very Anglo-Saxon feel off them. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't intentional. What happened was that because of the dictate that we want them to feel different but practical, uh, that it, it drew designs back towards things that looked familiar because of, of course, everything that can work in terms of weapons and armor has been done somewhere at some time. So if things look familiar, uh, like Andoril, for example, looks like your classic cruciform hilt European sword. Well, that was just how it ended up. Mm. But at the same time, it's different. Same with Boromir. Uh, the dynamics are also different. So, uh, but in actually getting back to the design side. So once the design was done, I was given the design and back in those days, it was literally pencil and paper quite often. Uh, today, everything's done on digitally on screens. So actually making changes was a bit more laborious. But once it had all been approved, then I was given the drawings to make the actual prop. Uh, sometimes I'd end up modifying a few things like making crosses a little bit chunkier, uh, just to make them easier to make and make them a little bit stronger against uh, taking blows. That had payoffs actually that when they create them in urethane, you put a bit of wire up the middle of something like the cross and having a little bit of, of bulk there does help. But at the same time, I didn't want to add too much bulk because bulk means weight, when you, especially when you're talking about steel and bronze. So my job was to interpret the design so that they didn't lose the all the design work that had been done and approved, but make them feel like um, real weapons. And I made them as real swords. So where a props maker would make it and not worry too much about the bulk of things because they know it's going to be plastic. I was very aware that you know, the density of steel changes a lot of stuff. And if you get the blade a little bit too heavy, it's really hard to deal with that and make it feel like a good prop. Did you so, get uh, did you get any feedback from Sean Bean as to what he thought of that particular sword? Uh, no, I didn't directly. I might I can't remember if I heard a few things secondhand, but he seemed happy enough with it. Yeah, I think it feels wonderful in the hand. Um, yeah. Do you know if he uses I mean, it often on screen as Vigo used his? Mm -hmm. Well, he, he didn't last so long, did he? <laughs> and that's true. <laughs> that is true. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, I'm sure that you'll be uh, talking about the dynamics a bit later on. But this sword is an interesting one, too, because, again, a lot of people try and talk about Oakshot's typology and where mm -hmm. the Lord of the Rings swords would fit in that. But the reality was that we weren't using, we weren't trying to follow any typology. So things like your fuller length and other things were not really part of the consideration. I was making to the design, but trying to make the design work as a, as a sword in terms of dynamics and flex and everything else. Right. So can you uh, describe, uh, when we first started talking, I asked you, um, would this sword be good for cutting, for example, tatami, like I do for in Hema? Yep. Um, and you mentioned that you, you thought that it might not um, be well suited because it had a little bit too much flex in the blade. Can you, can you discuss yep. um, the, the factors yep. that led to it being somewhat less than a, um, an optimally functional sword? Yeah. Um... Some of it was my experience at the time. Uh, I was used to making swords at the time, but uh, I was still learning a lot of stuff as I went. 
and at the time I hadn't had the chance to to handle original medieval swords to get a feel for what they were like. I did actually get a chance later on, which helped me a lot. But some of it was I would make the blade, for example, and then I would think about the things that I wish I'd done a bit differently. So when I talked about the blade being a bit too flexible, what happened was that I cut I cut my the blade from um, a spring steel strip, ground the fuller, I ground the fuller to an even depth initially, and then ran it out at the end where it joins the diamond section. And then to create that narrowing of the fuller, I cut the edges in so that, that ridge line narrowed it. But of course, by cutting that ridge line in, the ridge line gets thinner, which is a good thing. But overall, what happened was that the cross section and stiffness changed considerably along the length of the blade. So it was reasonably stiff up near the hilt, reasonably stiff in the diamond section, but just at that, just behind that um, point of the fuller, there was just a little bit too little metal. And so it wanted to flex more in that area. Mm. So what that meant was that if you're striking things, unless you're striking absolutely true, that your blade wants to flop around a bit more. Sure. And it wouldn't have taken much to change the dynamics, but the blades were already made. So when you were asking about a blade that would be suitable for cutting, I realized the one thing I wanted to change was to make the blade a bit stiffer through that section so that when you do that thing of put the point on against something and flex the blade, I want the blade to always have an even curvature on a sword like this, which means that the, the stiffness is even along the length of the blade. Now, that's not true for all blades, but for blades like this, I it tends to be about right because it means that uh, if you strike at all off with your blade twisted a little bit, you're less likely to have all your energy get thrown away by the blade flexing too much. Mm. And what I realized, all I had to do was instead of making my grind, initial grinds an even depth was to shallow it a bit towards the tip so that where the fuller might be about a millimeter thick uh, in the thinnest section right up near the hilt. Maybe it was one and a half to two millimeters thick before the run out. And that little bit of extra thickness meant that I, I didn't have to take so much off the edges either because the fuller was already narrowing a bit. And it just made that whole section that had been too flexible a bit stiffer. Interesting. And, uh, yeah. And then as I was doing the finer and finer grinds, I was just refining that flex a little bit further. It is really surprising removing uh, the metal at 120, 240, and then 400 grit finishing still changes the flex a bit. It's not simply refining the surface, it's still removing metal. Right. So even right. at that point, the, the flex and everything else on the blade is changing. And it's, it's knowing from experience what my final target is and making sure that I, I don't like, for example, over grind initially and then find that the blade is back to being too flexible. Right. Well, that's interesting. It's a little surprising. When, when you commented that you thought it was too flexible, I hmm. imagined you might add a little more in the, in the strong of the blade near the guard, but you're talking, yeah. you really need no, to out closer that wasn't, to the tip. Yeah, that wasn't where the issue was. But it's one of those things that I knew about it from the time. So when you brought up that question, it got me to thinking, well, this is something I can easily incorporate in all of the swords from here on. And right. so I did. Very good, very good. Um, well, yeah, let's, let's start talking about the, the dynamics of this sword um, and what I've seen. Um, so since you made the original version, which, which you've now modified, uh, you've been to, as you said, like the the uh, Royal Armories, I think, and, and a yep, few places to see them. and handle real uh, surviving examples of these swords. Of, of uh, Have you held any that are somewhat similar to this, a large Type 14, for example? Uh, not really. This is a quite a heavy sword, but I have handled a few bigger <clears throat> swords that have a similar feel. Okay. Um, Armory's sword for its size is actually quite heavy. Yeah, yeah, it is. But I have to say, you did a, an excellent job of of the with the the I guess with 
a lot of people would say balance, but it's a lot more than that. It's, it's mass distribution mm -hmm. because when I go to swing it, the blade's not too heavy. It doesn't want to drag me forward, but it's also not too light where I have to force it forward. Uh, any, any motion that I do with it, the, the mass of it seems to support the action that I'm doing. Yes. And I've noticed that in, in one other sword that I have that's very closely based on a historic original, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Black Prince sword from Oakshot's uh, personal collection. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, the guys at Arms and Armor have access to that sword. And they've they've used it to closely reproduce that sword, and it it's also uh, almost four pounds and with a point of balance about two inches from the guard, but yeah, uh, which is unusual. Its, yeah, yeah, it has this large pill shaped pommel, and when I when I do any motion, a cut in one hand or two, uh, it, it's it's supporting the cut. It feels like it's making mm -hmm. making the the cut stronger if I go for a thrust. Uh, that heavy pommel seems to be supporting what I'm doing rather than yeah. me me fighting it. Hmm. Yeah, um, I'm trying to think. So the things that I could compare it to, there there aren't really any that I've handled. One thing that did surprise me about most of the originals is that even the ones that on the scales were quite heavy. Uh, for example, I think it's the river. I can't remember if it's the River Within Sword, uh, the one that's at the York Museum. I got to handle that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the point of balance on that, admittedly, the blade has been resurfaced. So it had a lot of corrosion after it was found in the river. So the blade and everything else has been resurfaced. So the sword is overall a bit lighter than it was. But I can't remember the exact numbers, but I think it was around 1.4 kilograms, which was still quite heavy. Mm -hmm. The blade had a balance point about eight inches past the cross, which again sounds, by modern standards, like an unwieldy weapon. But I realized immediately that the purpose of that weapon was not defense. That was a slashing weapon. Mm. And where you want follow through with a blow and you're not going to stop it, you're probably just going to redirect that energy to come around for another strike and use a shield mm. as your second defense, as your main defense, not the sword, then it made a lot of sense. Yes. We, we get a bit fixated on this idea of medieval swords as fencing weapons today when actually a lot of the time they weren't. You relied on your shield and you relied on your armor for your defense a lot more so that you would free up the sword to be purely an offensive weapon. Yeah. So you didn't try and do much fencing with it. So you're not looking at the situation, say, for example, in the, the 133 manuscript where you've got uh, monks who aren't wearing armor who are fencing with lightweight one-handed swords. These swords of war were meant to do damage against yeah. armored people. Yeah. And so your own sword was made with that idea in mind as well. So a sword like Boromir's fits into that mold, whereas other swords like, say, Aragorn's sword is a bit more of a hand and a half cut and thrust sword that has good defensive properties. Boromir's mm -hmm. sword is really more optimized as an offensive weapon because it's simply a bit too heavy to quickly redirect that energy. So it weighs about 1.8 kilograms. Um, which for a one-handed sword is really heavy. So that's four pounds. And I realized that that was going to be an issue. Fortunately, the, the design had a large, heavy looking pommel built in. So I actually right. used that to make, to turn up a pommel on the lathe that was also quite heavy. And so we get this interesting dynamic that it's a heavy sword, but the point of balance, I think is only about one inch along the blade. So it's what most people would consider a bit too neutral in its feel by current standards. But, uh, and, and here's where, um, when I'm making say a, a 1.2 to 1.3 kilogram one-handed sword, I would be aiming for a mm. point of balance about four inches along the blade. Right. And there are, two, there are two basic numbers that I always use to just get a rough feel for how a sword might work in the hand. One is uh, torque on the wrist. So grams times balance point along the blade, or actually, taking it from the, the front of the grip in particular, because if you've got a cross that is very, very long, that actually changes, you know, effectively adds length. So multiply the grams by the centimeters. And I worked on a principle that light in the hand was about 10,000 gram centimeters. So uh, say a one kilogram sword balanced 10 centimeters or four inches along the blade. 15,000 is getting to the point where it's going to 
cause people some wrist problems unless they've got very strong arms. So that was always my guideline for one-handed swords. So that's mm -hmm. your static dynamic. But once it's moving, then of course it's about, um, okay, the sum of your, uh, well, your center of mass, your mass distribution and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where Boromir's sword works because uh, it's heavy, but the balance point is close to the grip. So it's not okay. hard on the wrist. But then once you get it moving, you've got mass. Yep. Uh, if you just exactly. rotate it in your hand, it feels light and it probably won't have much energy. But if you're starting a, a, a full meat swing, yep. then sure, you're pushing a lot of mass, but it's not trying to drag you your hand back by being too blade heavy. So it's actually going with your hand pretty well. So it's a sword that on paper probably shouldn't work as well mm -hmm. as it does. And I think you had a few comments like that on your cutting videos. But, yeah, but it, it's, it, yeah, it works but very it's, well, surprisingly well. Yeah. It, well, the comment I think that you might be thinking of is that it wasn't my comment, it was other people. Mm. When I described the properties of the sword and they watched me cut with it, they were like, yep. wait a minute, that's a four pound sword? It doesn't yep. look like it, especially when I'm doing the yep. double cuts with so, the sword in one hand and so forth. Yep. So hold it in your hand and you see the scale of it, though maybe it's not so obvious with you because you're quite a big guy. But yeah, you, you start to realize actually that blade is like, what is it, seven centimeters across? It's a broad, broad blade and it's a big mm -hmm. pommel. And yeah. it's a sword that is still a 32 inch blade, I think it is. So it's it's still proper one handed sword size, but it's there's just a lot more of it, I right. suppose you'd say. Yep. And yeah, on paper, a lot of people would look at this and say this shouldn't work, but but that's the difference between numbers on a sheet of paper and uh, the, the actual dynamics in the hand. Yeah. Well, another thing I noticed is you certainly uh, accomplished your goal of making it not too flexible. If you watch the cutting video as well, hmm. there's not a whole lot of flex in the blade. If you grab the tip, you can flex it, but dynamically, it, it has enough stiffness for what it needs to do, hmm. is what I observe. Even cutting through the two tatami mats, uh, it did quite well. Yeah, and that, that little bit of extra meat towards the end of the fuller doesn't make a great difference to the overall sword. It's probably about an extra 10 to 20 grams of metal. And because there's such a large pommel, it really doesn't change the, the, dynamic, uh, the dynamics or the balance point appreciably. And uh, at the same time, it gives you a blade that isn't going to try and trail if you're, if you're not striking dead true. So for example, if you've got a slight twist in your cut which i know you would never do but <laughs> somebody else might that you don't get that thing of the blade just goes flobble right. when you hit right. something and it throws all that energy into sideways movement instead of cutting through that little bit of extra stiffness i think makes a lot of difference there and it makes yeah. a sword like this a little bit more forgiving of miss strikes mm. like again you get this it's the same issue with japanese swords i think you would have done a few of those as well Mm -hmm. that uh, you can destroy a Japanese blade with one bad strike if you really, really screw it up. If it's differential heat treated, yeah. Yeah, so, so that's an example where the training with, goes with the sword. Like the katana, a traditionally made katana, I call it the Formula One paradox. Mm. It's, it's like it's the most amazing weapon in the world when you use it right. But it, like with a Formula One car, you screw up one gear change and you've just destroyed it. Um, right. It's that thing of it's it's an unforgiving weapon, but it's amazing when you do it right. But yeah. then the person has to be trained along with the sword. Yes. Yeah, I I, I cannot say enough good things about the the dynamics of that sword. I really really enjoy it. Uh, I also, another thing that stands out, it's just the very, very high level of, of fit and finish. I, I zoomed you. in on the, on the construction here on the cross. I mean, there's no, some people when they're reviewing even, you know, swords that are a couple of thousand dollars from high-end producers, they might complain about, well, there's a little bit too much of a gap here between the, the blade and the cross guard and so on. But uh, this is just beautifully done and all the transitions are very smooth. 
Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it is something we work hard at because we know, for example, that people are going to photograph it at this level of detail. And so yep. something that's a, like a millimeter sized floor that to your eye is nothing. When you expand a picture up like this, you can see everything. There's no hiding. And I figure that at that price point, you should be expecting something that's very close to perfection. Right. And of course, that is where a chunk of the cost goes at that point, is that yep. there's a lot of hand finishing and a lot of very careful fitting to try and get this working this way. Right. It's an amazing sword. Um, well, can we uh, jump back a little bit? Um, I know you've talked about it in the past, but specifically, you know, how did you get your start in um, in reenacting, and what kind of of swords did you make initially when you, when you first started out? Hmm. Yeah, well, I got when I got started in reenacting. So we've got to remember that this is uh, 1982 that I started my first, you know, dabble into reenactment, and uh, there was no internet. Uh, here in New Zealand, we're at the far end of the world, so there was just no way of sourcing anything. So that's why I started making swords and pieces of armour, was because for my own needs, but also later on for other people, when they they uh, you know decided that, okay, they wanted me to make stuff for them as well. Uh, the situation back then was, yeah, I, if you didn't make it yourself, you probably just couldn't get it. Um, and the few wall hangers that were available were really, really bad, like literally unsafe to try and use. So, yeah, so I started making for weapons for the medieval reenactment community. So they were your typical fullered long swords and uh, mm -hmm. mostly one handed swords. And then it just slowly grew from there. Very nice. Um... So have you ever taken any of your swords and tried uh, cutting with them? Done any test cutting? Uh, not of my own swords. I've done test cutting with other sharp swords. The funny thing is that most of the swords I've made over the years have been blunt. I've made very few sharps. Mm. Uh, Reenactors in particular, of course, they wanted quite thick edges. Sure. Uh, to the point where it was difficult to get good dynamics, but um, got there reasonably well. The, the interesting thing is that reenactors, the swords have to be really robust, but not overly heavy. So that actually taught me a lot of things the hard way about heat treatment and fitting so that things don't rattle over time. And uh, I'm actually quite happily surprised to see that some swords that I made back in the 90s are still going. Awesome. Very nice. Well, I think we're down to the last question I had for you. Um, uh, you've mentioned in other interviews that all the other people, let's say John Howe, uh, exclude him, but most other people involved with the movies, when they look at your swords, they just see props, right? You made yep. you made a real sword, but to them, it's it's strictly a prop. Yeah, correct. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's right. It actually is. It, it creates some awkward situations that I have to put signs on things saying, "Hey, this one is sharp. Please don't touch it," because right. otherwise people just assume that they're blunt props when actually sometimes I'm making real sharp swords that are uh, really dangerous. Yeah. So you, uh, you mentioned that, that uh, well, so I made that cutting video with the, with the mm -hmm. Sword of Boromir and sent it to you uh, a few years ago. And you mentioned that you shared it with people at Weta and uh, you yep. said Richard Taylor saw it. I know I, I sent it to yep. John Howe as well. Have you gotten feedback from those uh, people now seeing some of these swords a sword being used uh, for sword-like function, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's um, it's still interesting that they're really impressed that that you know that at how a sharp sword performs, but some people are still a little bit confused about sword versus prop. Hmm. And they and I, I literally have in the past had comments of why would you why would you ever want a sharp sword? <laughs> Where, and my response is always well. A sword by definition should be sharp. We're actually doing it deliberately wrong here because we don't want it to do the one thing a sword is meant to do, which is cut and slice, uh, you know, cut and thrust. Exactly. So, um, yeah, it's sort of odd that there, there is definitely a different mindset. Whereas I, 
this is where I think that I helped the process in Lord of the Rings because I came in as a sword maker, doing armor as well initially, but ultimately I concentrated on the swords. And because I was always approaching it from a sword maker uh, viewpoint instead of a props maker viewpoint, I think that it did help the swords you know, in terms of overall chunkiness and mass dynamics. I was always thinking about things like, okay, this, this actor isn't very strong, so try and make the sword as light as possible for them so that they're more likely to say that they're happy to carry it on set rather than saying, give me the aluminium one. Right. right. And of course, to me, the more that they're OK about using the steel hero prop, the, the more of a win that is. Yeah. But yes, it is, it is quite a different mindset. And it took me a fair while to um, get my head around the different approaches. Well, Peter, it has been an absolute pleasure uh, to speak with you. Yep. Uh, I really appreciate things. it. Yep. Yeah. I'm, and I'm always happy to talk about you know, sword dynamics and things like that, because, uh, yeah, it, it's always good to find an audience that, that appreciates it. Right. Well, I look forward to speaking with you in the future. I'm sure we'll chat on Facebook, but mm. uh, um, stay safe with the pandemic and everything. And, and I will uh, look forward to talking to you in the future. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And uh, look after yourself. Okay. Okay. Cheers. Cheers.